It is good to see you all this morning and together turn to God's Word. In your copies of God's Word, turn with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Our text will be from verse 42 to the end of the chapter. Mark chapter 9 from verse 42 to the end of the chapter. Let us hear God speak to us in his word. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For every one will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have privilege this morning of hearing you speak to us. In this inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And Lord, pray that you will aid me by your spirit, as has been prayed, to be able to say your word as it is for application and for us to be changed here this morning. And in Christ's name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. I take this morning forms part of a larger passage of scripture. In fact, I have chopped it. It is a longer text than what I have read. But it is formed part of a single piece of scripture or text that teaches on a single theme. It begins really at verse 30 of Mark chapter 9. But I'm not going to focus on those sections uh, in their entirety, but as I said, only the ones we've read, verses 42 to 50. But if you were to divide it up, you could consider, as I said, verses 30 to 37 as the first section, and then 38 to 41 as the second section, and then 42 to the end as our third section, which is our section for today. But all these three sections address, as I said, one issue, and the issue of humility and what God requires of us as his followers. Humility in the area of saying, are we humble as Christ is humble, first of all. And then also we will see humility in terms of how we regard ourselves and how we deal with our sins and what Jesus has to say here. And so this is about the radical marks of a genuine believer. We face a significant problem as uh, humanity when it comes to humility because the standard by which we are to measure ourselves is Jesus Christ, and we know that. 
However, we don't always measure ourselves against Jesus. Whenever we are to check whether we are humble, we don't say, he has the standard of humility. Do we measure up to this standard or not? Because we know, if we are honest with ourselves, that we will fall short. None of us can be as humble as Jesus was. Instead, what we do in order for ourselves or for us to say that we are humble, we tend to look at other people and compare ourselves to them and then think that we are better than they are. And it's easy to pass the test if you're going to do that because you can easily pick the most horrible and prideful person. And in fact, we not only think that we are more humble than other people, but we also have a tendency to look at our sins or uh, to look at the sins of others and think that we are better than they are. Again, it is very easy to find people that we can simply label as evil and as sinful and then say, we are not that sinful. We say, that is evil, but I am not that evil. And our perceptions of ourselves are often deceiving. And we do not like to see ourselves as we truly are. If we were to examine ourselves, we will give ourselves a pass. Because we know that we are not good people. Or if we are going to say that we are not good, we are not going to give the true state of how evil we truly are, and how sinful we truly are. So there are two things there. We either do not want to give a true state of what we are, or we do not really know and do not really see how evil and sinful we are. But it is so easy to, for us to focus on evil murderers, on, on corrupt leaders in our country, and then talk about them and then say, we are not like them. And then say, we are not like that. And we know how it happens often here in our country. We see so much evil, so much sin, so much corruption, so much, so much disobedience against God. And it is so easy for us to say, we are not like that. And we pray against evil and corruption, and it is important for us to do so. Uh, but we should not do so thinking that, but we are better. But when we think about Jesus, and even if we are to think about humility, we tend to put on false humility. Some people I will say, yes, we know that we are not humble like Jesus, acknowledging that we are not all that humble. Uh, but often that humility is um, uh, deceiving because it does not acknowledge the true problem. That's in front of the person. But when it comes to acknowledging uh, that we are really not like Jesus and what that means, not being like Jesus does not mean we are close to being like Jesus. We are not close to being like Jesus. We are far off. But we like using vague terms like we know we are not good. I know I'm not good. I know that I sin, and we know that we all struggle. But, brothers and sisters, that is to put it very, very mild. The Bible doesn't put our sin so mildly. The Bible doesn't just say we are not good and leave it there as vague as it is. The Bible doesn't say, well, we all struggle. Yes, James says we all make many mistakes. The Bible says all those things. But if you were to look at what the Bible means by what it says in all those things, we will see that that's it, that is not what we usually convey when we utter those words. Because even when we say we are not good, if you were to find somebody who says I'm not good or somebody who says I sin and I struggle and we were to ask them, okay, name the, the bad that you are or that you do or name your sins or what do you struggle with, you are still going to minimize your struggles, your sins, and how bad you are. We will fail to name the sins as they are. 
we will even fail to admit how proud we are. And we will fail to lay bare who we truly are and how God truly looks at us and sees us. And in this, we fail. We fail even when we try to confess and to admit our sinfulness and our wrongfulness and our pridefulness. We sin because we do not portray a true picture. That's sin. We fall short. We fail, again, because we think we, be- we are better than we are. And we are not better than we are. And the other area, and you will see, this is what one of the passages here, or the, the, the text that we see here, the disciples were even debating about their skillfulness, who is skilled, who is better among us. That is what we also do. We fail because we think that we are better than we are. We think like the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were thinking here in our text that they, are, they were skilled than they were. We think that we are competent at some things than we really are. And usually those would include things that we would want people to look at and ask to be honored for being godly in those areas when we really are not. And sadly, we have a tendency to think of ourselves as important. Not to say that you are unimportant, beloved. But we think of ourselves as important. We think of ourselves as doing better for God than others. We may not always say that explicitly, but we think so. We, think, we may think that our church is better than that one. And people do that sometimes. Our church is better. Or that church is better than that church. I have not been on social media for maybe about close to 10 years now, if not 10 years. Left social media, maybe 8 years. Let me not exaggerate. I'll also be sinning by not saying truly what has been my social media use, but it has been more than five years that I can safely say. But there was a time when there was a, a church that was opened, it was existing church in there, and they had a Facebook page at that time, and people were very excited about this church that's been built, Facebook page set up, and then people were rating the church, and then they were giving it five stars. You know what I did the rating I gave, and I got into trouble. And then I said, is it possible to give a judge five star? <laughs> no. And some people are still not happy with me to this day that I didn't give a judge five star rating. It's not possible. But that's what we think we are. We think a church can get five stars. And then you'll have Jesus walk among the church. And they'll say, yeah, I can see this good thing. I can see this and that. And then he will say, but. He will say that in every single church. There is no church where Jesus will say, and nothing here, perfect, five stars. There's no five-star church. But we tend to think that we are better than others. But in order for us to align ourselves with the heart of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to think of ourselves the way God thinks of us. We ought to be humble. Look at verse 30 to verse 37. We won't read there. Verse 30 to verse 37. The disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ argue about a problem that we all face. They were disputing among themselves about who the greatest is. And I have to give the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ credit here. Probably Peter was the one leading this talk or discussion because Peter is uh, more like us. Uh, He is a sinner. He doesn't, he's not shy all that much. 
But I have to give them credit here for their openness. Even though they, this passage reveals Jesus' deity because it doesn't seem like they were talking openly, Jesus hearing them, but they were whispering and saying in silence. And Jesus was seeing in their hearts how they were thinking in their hearts. And even what they were saying to one another was not even reflecting the depth of what they were feeling in their hearts about who was great among them. But this is what they were thinking. But Jesus, without them talking to him, he knew what they were arguing about, even though they tried to keep it a secret. Look at verse 33 and 34. When they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about? On the way, but they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. It seems that, as I said, to give them credit, at least they were able to argue and talk about amongst themselves, who do you think is, is great? Uh, I've, I've not seen believers do that in my, in my Christian walk. But maybe we do it in our, in our hearts. But I will, I will wait to see. I don't know. Has anybody seen a group of believers talking about who is great among us? We don't do that. The disciples did it. But it's sinful what they're doing. They were quarreling and they were allowing their sinfulness to show. But Jesus did not need them to show, uh, to show him their sinfulness. He knew. He knew what was deep down in their hearts. He is God. He can see. He can see each and every single heart sitting here this morning. He can see our heart's disposition, whether we are humble or not, whether we see ourselves as in need of mercy and grace or not, whether we mean what we've just sung, that we long for him as the deer pants for the water, whether we know and acknowledge that everything that we do is by his grace or we take credit for some of the things. Jesus knows our hearts. We may not do so openly, but we are exactly like the disciples, asking ourselves who is great among us. Or in envy, looking at other people and wishing, I, could, I wish I could be like this person because we think that they are great. But that's not how God thinks. There is no one who is great in God's eyes, in the way that we think of greatness. And we don't argue, as I said, openly. But there is something that we do, even though we don't call ourselves great. There's something that we do. We are quick to call people great. We have done it. We have sinned in praising people and praising certain churches, saying so-and-so is great or that church is great. And you have heard me, brothers and sisters, lament that there is so much idol worship that is happening, idolizing men in the universal church today, and it is scary that people don't realize how much we idolize people. We call them great, and the question I usually ask is, by what standard do we measure greatness? And some people don't even think that they are idolizing certain churches or certain preachers when, in fact, they are idolizing those preachers. But then in verses 38 to verse 41, we see Jesus confronting the believers there, his disciples. He confronts the, the temptation of thinking that even their group of people or the group that we associate ourselves with is, is the one that is great or that does things the right way. And as we know, brothers and sisters, this is a problem we have in our world, in Christendom. We have so many people who call themselves Christians and those who would say they are the Baptist, not the pet Baptist, and whatever else they may call ourselves. And we may think that we are in the group of the best, those who do things the right way and fail to love and care for those that we differ with, disagree with, 
and respect them as God's people. Because brothers and sisters, I've often heard, and I told you once about an American preacher who called out other American preachers who like saying this is great and that is great. There are, if the stats are correct, the stage, about 7 billion people in the world. And we don't even know 1 billion of those people. Yet when people talk about some kind of work, they tend to think that it is so great. A billion out of 7 billion, 7 billion is not great. And that is me just being generous. We don't even know a million. People will call preachers like John MacArthur, John Piper, and Luther Calvin, and many others. They will say that they are great. But if you think about the work that God is doing, that we cannot see with our eyes, that we do not know of, because people tend to think that the whole world, if something is happening in one part of the, of the world, is happening everywhere in the world, uh, they, they tend to think that that is something that is affecting the whole world. But the work of those men and the work that they do is not even worth half a drop in the ocean of what God is doing in the world. This is not to say we have to minimize them and we have to despise them, but we have to be honest. We have to only bow to God and be humble and look at God as the only one who is great. Not men, not anyone, not even ourselves. Just as much as we tend to make much of our, our favorite people, we tend to make also little of our sins and their sins. Recently, we have seen many people who people have called great committing sins. And then because you have this person who has been called great committing sin, people have found themselves not knowing what to do with the sin of this person. Whereas if they had had somebody, if it were somebody else committing the, the same sin, they would have had that no hesitation to call it exactly what it is. But we create words that don't even exist in the Bible. Somebody sins, and then we say that they have committed something that's inappropriate. Find inappropriate as a sin listed in the Bible. That's how much we sin. I shared with Pastor Tebuho that somebody I used to work with, they also had somebody who they called great, who was working with them. And this man fell into sexual immorality, adultery, I won't call it inappropriate behavior. That's not inappropriate behavior. It is sexual immorality. It is adultery. He's disqualified from ever speaking about the Lord again and standing in the pulpit and saying that he was a man of God. He was not. And then this, I don't even cast aspersion, but this dear brother is talking about this man, this man who sinned and, in fact, after sinning, committed suicide. But when he is asked a question about whether if somebody has committed adultery, can they be restored to ministry again, to the pulpit again? And people have different views about that. And my view is that they shouldn't. I don't see scripture allowing for people to be restored to the pulpit again. But it was interesting what this man said. He said that before the case of this dear friend of his, he would have had, had no hesitation answering that question. He said, before then, I had an answer to this question. But now that he has this man that I admired, adored, I was shocked and rattled by his fall, I now have to evaluate my position on where I stand with regards to whether people who have fallen into adultery who are preachers are disqualified from preaching or pastoring or not. What had happened was that here's somebody that they adore. It wasn't the scriptures that made him evaluate or reevaluate his position. 
as um, noble as it may have been, experiences can never cause us to reevaluate the word of God. Uh, experience is also never a valid test of truth. Just as we apply the same test to people who come to us and claim to have strange, miraculous experiences with God and base their the truth on their experience and want to make the truth uh, or the experience a valid test of truth to say, if it happened, then it must be true. The word of God is the standard by which we measure all things. It doesn't matter who falls or who does what. As the, if the Bible speaks on an issue, it affects every body. And we don't change our positions because of a certain person. Yes, we can be broken. We, we, we can even admit and say, because of how I love this person and adore them, they, this even shook my convictions. Yes, we can acknowledge those things because they happen. But we cannot move from our convictions other than the word of God and the spirit of God being the one to convict us to rethink a position. But all that, all that points to is that we don't know, or we don't regard sin as great as we should. Because, yes, we may be grieved and they may be grieved when somebody falls into sin, but we've seen people fall into adultery and sexual immorality many, many times, and we know what the Bible says so clearly. But if it's somebody who does it, then all of a sudden, we have to think about how serious the sin is, or what should we make of it. We should be all the time broken whenever someone falls and we should forever be thinking about how great sin is and be praying for one another as God's people and taking sin as it is and being humble enough to know that we do not really see or know the depths of our sins. That is why we need to rely on the Lord to continually wash us by his word and sanctify us by his word, which is truth so that we will not fall away by minimizing sin and by not being humble enough to recognize the problem that is us. But look at verse 42 and following then and see that sin is a bigger problem than we think it is. As I said, we often think that and believe that sin is not serious. And the reason I say this is because we we think that we can deal with our sin by our own strengths. And here I'm going to adopt a position that is in the minority. And uh, that's one of the things that you have to know about me. Some of you do that some positions I take are in the minority. But you will see how Jesus says we have to be radical about dealing with sin. And yet he's challenging, remember, as I said, the the issue here is about humility and whether people really recognize and acknowledge the depth and the gravity of their sins. And Jesus is showing us how great and how dangerous and how sinful sin is. John Owen says we have to be killing it before it kills us. It kills. And if we are to deal with it, we cannot adopt soft measures. And Jesus here is giving us radical measures because here are these people who are not so humble and Jesus is challenging them. And this is why I take the position I take and I'll give you more reasons about what I'm talking about there. You see that Jesus is talking about if your foot causes you, or, or firstly, if your hand causes you to, to fall away or to sin, cut it off. And then people will say that that's hyperbole. Well, as I said, I'm in the minority to say that Jesus is being literal. Jesus is saying, if your sin, brother and sister, your hand, rather, causes you to sin, and if you want your hand to stop causing you to sin, cut it off. 
It's not hyperbole. Now Jesus is bringing the seriousness of what sin does to the attention of these disciples who are not humble, who are even talking about who is great. Well, Jesus is going to say, well, if you are great, let's look at what causes you to sin. And if those things that cause you to sin are part of your body and you're going to then remove them, what are you going to be left with? And would you still look at yourself that way and still say, I'm great? Or if you were offered this as a way to deal with your sin, would you take it? If Jesus were to say to you, in order for you to be forgiven of this sin that your hand has cost you to, to do, cut off the hand and the sin will be forgiven. How many would do it? Show of hands. Oh, Ndu and Kutrelo say that. Well, how about this? In verse 45, and if your foot causes you to fall, to fall away, cut it off. Cut off your feet, cut off your legs. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. Do it. Chop them off so that you don't sin. Well, maybe we can do that, do an Kukrelo. Uh, but verse 47, and if your eye causes you to fall away, gut it out. No anesthesia. Just remove the eye. And then your sin will be removed. Well, there are a number of reasons why I do not take this to be hyperbole. And I take it to be literal. Let me give you a number of those. This is not exhaustive. By any means, and I don't mean to be exhaustive as we are taking a break from a study of First Corinthians. But number one, Jesus is talking to real people here, and he is not talking about a um, figurative thrown into the sea. He's talking about a literal thrown into the sea. And secondly, Jesus is not talking about if you're you know, cutting your hand, and it is better for you to enter life, which will be the eternal life, the new heavens and the new earth. That's not figurative. It is a literal new heavens, new earth, new life. Or go to hell where there is unquenchable fire. That's not figurative language. That's literal language. Hell fire is unquenchable. And so it would be difficult for me to go from hyperbole, literal, hyperbole, literal, if I'm going to be consistent in my exegesis of the text. Why would I jump from literal to non-literal? Because I, I, we think, well, no, Jesus doesn't really mean cut off your hand, but he really means going to heaven and going to hell. You see, that's inconsistent. But when it comes to us and sin, uh, we must realize that we can sin against God greatly. And God can offer us many options. And here he's not even offering us to do the law, saying do these commandments and then you will be good. He's offering us something that is very radical. But we sin against God, and not only with our actions, not only with our hands, not only with our feet, not only with our eyes, but with our hearts. We are that depraved. And that is our heart's disposition. We are sinful. And we have to realize that even if we do not sin with our actions, even if maybe you may be spared and say, I don't have to cut off my hand. It's not cost me to sin. Jesus talks about causing other people to sin as a sin as well, which is very dangerous and grave. And it is huge. Look at verse 42. Jesus says, but 
Whoever causes one of these little ones, earlier on he had talked about children in this text. But here he says, whoever, and that is anyone, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away. So Jesus is not talking about something that is figurative. If you as a believer causes another believer to sin, Jesus says it would be better for you if a heavy mill stone were hung around your neck and were thrown into the sea. Jesus says if you were to cause somebody to sin, it would be better for you to have a, a tractor tire hung around your neck and then thrown into the sea. It's better for you to die. And that's what Jesus will do if he cause people to sin. He will not hesitate to kill you. You deserve to die. But there's an important thing to notice here in understanding what the little ones mean here. Remember I said the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ are arguing about who is great here. And when Jesus uses this phrase, he's using it not to refer to little children. If they're going to allow their hearts, and if we're going to allow our hearts to say, well, there is a hierarchy of who is great and who is not great, and people that we honor and those that we don't honor. And when we look at different people, we attach different statuses to them. We're going to, have to end up having people who in our list are down there, low class, little ones. If in your heart there is a person who you favor, you show favoritism to, compared to another human being who is made in the image and likeness of God, brother and sister, repent. All of God's people are equal and the same. So to say little ones, this will be somebody who is despised. The disciples are willing to have in their minds somebody who is to be despised. And we think that, well, if it causes that one to sin, it's not really a big deal. Well, Jesus is saying you've sinned in two ways. Firstly, there is no one who is despised or who is so-called little one. Just like the Corinthians who were saying, there are some who are weaker. We are not weak. We are strong. And Paul aligned himself with the weak, the marginalized, and those who were despised. We should not despise anybody. And then, my radical understanding then that I pose of cutting off your, the parts of your body, Jesus knows, and even if he is offering this as a real solution to sin, saying, well, well, well okay, Jesus, I, I, I see that it is my hand that's causing me to sin. The question is, will cutting it off cause you to stop sinning? It will not. Will gouging, gouging out your eye cause you to stop sinning? Not. Will cutting your feet or your legs cause you to stop sinning? They won't. You will still have your heart. That will still sin. Jesus is showing us here, brothers and sisters, that what we need for us to be forgiven and for us to be righteous in his sight for us not to fall into the sin of thinking that we are great and for us to not cause others to sin and regard others as equal is to recognize that we belong to Jesus Christ as his children, as his brothers and sisters, not because of anything that we have done, but we belong to Christ because of his great mercy 
and his great love. Jesus indeed died on the cross. It was not a spiritual death. It was death on the cross. For you not to have to die for your sins. There's nothing radical that you can do. As much as this passage is about being radical about your sin, you cannot do anything to gain forgiveness because forgiveness is not even by works. You ask for forgiveness. And we have to admit and say, Jesus, my eye, my hand, my feet are not worthy of even paying for my sins. I will not offer you that. I will offer you my true repentance. And radical turning away, which is what I think even people who take this as hyperbole still arrive at this conclusion, that this is about radically turning away from sin and doing away with it completely. Those who don't take it literal will say it's as if you are cutting off something. And where we agree is Jesus is saying, do away with your sins. And here will be the sin of pride and the sin of making light of your sins and the sin of looking down on those for whom Christ died. Because if you fail to do so, look at what Jesus says in verse 49 and 50, and then we'll end there. He says, for everyone will be salted with fire, and those who will go to hell, they, they will have, they will burn everlastingly, unquenchable fire in, in hell. And Waona Tigva asked me yesterday if, if truly it will be unquenchable and how long will be too long and how forever will be, how, how long forever will be, forever and ever, and the worm does not die. But look at what he says, and this is where I believe the hyperbole then comes into play because of how what Jesus says here is reality and not just hyperbole in verse 50. Salt is good. Yes, if it's used for what is good. But if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? And Tigba got it, got it right when I asked, can salt lose its saltiness? And that's what people think, and that's how people have interpreted this passage. Uh, one rabbi asked his disciple this question, can salt lose its saltiness? And while this disciple was trying to come up with an answer, and the rabbi slept and saying, stupid. How can salt lose its saltiness? It's still salt. There's nothing you can do to salt for salt to lose its saltiness. Salt remains salt. How can you remove Salt from salt. And Jesus is trying to show us, if you are a believer, you know what the marks of, a being, of being a believer are. And you will forever be a believer. But if not, you will be in hell forever. And you need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, for you to be in the new heavens and the new earth and have life everlastingly and be that salt that will not lose its flavor because a believer will always be a believer. And this is the grace that Jesus is extending to you, that even if you have sinned in this way and see that your sins require you, if you were to think that I must gush out my eye, I must cut off my hand or my legs because this is how much I have sinned. Jesus is saying, don't do that. You won't lose your saltiness. That doesn't mean you're no longer a believer. Jesus is not saying, I'm going to look down on you and despise you for sinning. He's calling you to repent and you will not lose your saltiness. You will forever be his child. All he's asking is for you to forever come to him humbly and repent of your sins and follow him and treat his people with respect and care. Have salt among yourselves 
and be at peace with one another, which is a contrast to what these were doing at verse 32, wanting to say, there's a little one. Jesus is saying, have peace with one another. Be equal to one another. Treat one another the same way. Love one another as I have loved you. Don't cause people to sin because you know what sin will do to you is cause the Lord Jesus to die. It will kill you. Kill it. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And he will forgive greatly. And you, as a believer, will never lose your saltiness. You'll forever be the salt and the light of the world. There's no going to be a time when your salt is out and you're no longer the salt of the earth. And this makes sense. In fact, I'm not going to go there, but you will see when Jesus goes to the next section and talks about divorce, how this idea of being fasting for forgiveness and forgiving will play an important role. But brothers and sisters, we will see one another forever and ever. Uh, we will not die because of our faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be in that beautiful city of God. And with that, let us stand and sing in closing then, sweet by and by.